everyone, and welcome to the third annual uh, CyberSight Cataract Conference. Uh, and uh, this is named after one of the great cataract surgeons of our generation, Alan Crandall. Uh, and we're uh, so proud to be able to put this on. This was really uh, the brainchild of uh, Hunter Turwick, medical director of uh, Orbis. And this is, as I said, the third year uh, that we're doing this. Uh, we have a, a, a terrific faculty, some of the best uh, cataract uh, teachers that I know. Uh, Nick Mamelis from Utah, Mitch Weikert from Houston and Baylor, and Nicole Fram from Los Angeles, Kendall Donaldson from Miami and Baskin Palmer, and Abe Vasabada uh, from uh, India. And the format is I've asked uh, each of our faculty pr to present uh, one of their best teaching videos or teaching talks, uh, and then we'd like to follow that with a little panel discussion. And uh, you, our audience, you have the opportunity to pose questions through uh, the Zoom uh, function. Uh, and at the end, we've really allocated a good amount of time for uh, a question and answer, which will again uh, have you pose uh, through uh, the Zoom box. So I'm going to start with uh, Nick Mamlis, who will present the first case. And uh, Nick was one of uh, Alan's partners at the Moran Eye Institute in Utah, and I've asked Nick to maybe say a few things about Alan Crandall. Nick? Well, thank you very much, David. If we could go ahead and get my um, slides up. I would like to take a little bit of time to talk about my um, longtime colleague, Alan Crandall, who sadly passed away about two and a half years ago. Alan is the epitome of a humanitarian. He started doing work uh, worldwide almost 30 years ago. He would make trips to Ghana. He worked with the Himalayan Cataract Project and then was instrumental in setting up Moran Eye Centers, um, international work. We now have a fellowship there and we now have a full center that does outreach work, not only around the world, but also um, locally in, in Southern Utah. We have the Navajo Nation where our, our outreach people work. Um, Alan epitomized the old saying that says, if you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. If you teach a man to fish, he eats for a lifetime. And Alan truly believed this. He was involved in teaching. He didn't want to just fly into a place where there's a great need and perform as many cataract surgeries as possible, but he wanted to teach. He wanted to get local ophthalmologists, local nurses, local technicians involved and the help teach them to how to, how to treat the, the huge problem of cataracts worldwide. Now, Alan has received numerous humanitarian awards. He received the ASCRS Humanitarian Award, which Dr. Which Dr. Um, David Chang had kindly donated. And in fact, now it is named the uh, Chang Crandall Award. He received the award from AAO for humanitarian. He received multiple, multiple humanitarian awards. Now, for me personally, um, Alan Crandall was my travel, my travel partner. Alan and I traveled the world for 35 years. We, we lectured, we taught courses, but, but more than that, we got a chance to experience the culture worldwide. So Alan was a great friend and I miss him dearly. Now, today I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna show you a case. Now, you're gonna see some wonderful cases by outstanding surgeons, you're gonna see some techniques that'll, that are just unbelievable. I wanna show you a simple, basic case and what to do with a simple complication. Now, this is a resident case. This is done at, at our veterans hospital. And this is a, a cataract in a patient with a, a history of Flomax use. Unfortunately, Tamsil, unfortunately, we did not have any Omidria available. So it's, it's a relatively uh, moderate cataract. We're doing pre-chop and we make the pre-chops and we go ahead and we um, make a crack right there. And you can see as we're doing this, the pupil is starting to come down. So you see right now it's getting floppy, it's coming down. And so the resident is really struggling to see what's going on here. She's, she's rotating it around. Again, I apologize for the quality of the video, but I do wanna talk about what to do in, in some simple, well, not simple, but straightforward cases of complications. So here we are, we're working, we're working, the pupil's coming down, it's going toward the, the stab incision. 
And we're still working away here. Now you're starting to see the red reflex show up. Now I wanna go ahead and, and I wanna stop it right here. And I'm gonna ask our panel now, I realize that the pupil's not well dilated. We didn't have Omidra available. Um, first of all, what is the panel seeing, especially in that top left corner? Pretty clear view. Yeah, Nick, it looks like there really is quite a floppy iris there. And we can see that the iris is getting uh, sort of incarcerated in that paracentesis a bit. And um, you know, as with all good resident cases, they can go on for a while and the pupil just tends to get smaller and smaller and smaller in these cases, the longer the case goes. And obviously this is still early in the case. So I'm a little concerned about how this pupil is gonna end up by the end of the case. Well, I think what I wanted to show, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go forward is if, if you look right up in here, there's a little clear area here. And now it wasn't apparent to me initially, yeah. but as we reviewed the videos, it, it became more apparent. So, um, you know, the question is, should we have stopped here? Should we even consider putting in hooks? It's very difficult, especially once the, the rexus has been made and we're at this point to have a, a second year resident put in hooks. And so we could have traded places and put in some hooks, but at this point, um, we just went ahead and we proceeded. So let me go ahead and go a little bit further now. Now, right there, you see that clear space right there at the top left. What did we do wrong right there? Well, everything. Yeah. I, no, you, you have to have hooks. I mean, I don't understand the, the concept that it's too hard to put in hooks. Like, if I start seeing the Rexis come down, um, you know, we just, we we put hooks in to stabilize. I think that it, you know a lot of times they have floppy bags as well as floppy iris, in in my experience. And so, it's really important. You can't go where you can't see. Uh, that's always how I think about things. Um, and I, I so agree I, with that fully. In retrospect, we should have put in hooks because we had a really inadequate view, and that would have helped tremendously. Um, when we're right here, what we did is we made the first mistake and that there's that clear area that you can see a little bit superiorly there. And so what happened is, is we pulled out the fake emulsification handpiece before we put OVD in. And so I think the first teaching point I really want to stress on this case is if you're suspecting a capsular tear of any kind, do not let the chamber shallow. Go ahead and place OVD in through your stab incision and then keep your, you know, keep your fake emulsification handpiece in there so that the chamber doesn't shallow and then go to position zero and come out. But um, what happened, the resident came out just immediately as soon as she, she recognized that before I could put OVD in. And so the first thing is always put OVD in before you're removing an instrument from the eye. Now we went ahead and we put in a lot of OVD and we looked at this, we rotated those pieces around. Now there's still quite a bit of a nucleus left in there, but what's interesting is we weren't seeing any signs of, of any vitreous coming forward. So we went ahead, put in ample OVD to push the capsule back and to raise those little pieces of nucleus up out of the bag a little bit. So now we're, I'm, I sped this up for purposes of, of going ahead and so, what, I'm, what we're doing now is I'm not letting the resident chop these pieces. I'm having her keep this in one big piece so that we can go ahead and we can pull this out and we can get this out without at the risk of smaller pieces falling backwards. And so we're just working at this in one big piece of nucleus here because I want her, want her to get all the nucleus out before anything can go south. And again, I apologize for all the movement that's inherent in in doing surgery. Now, what did we do again? We came out without OVD. So now we go ahead and we go in and, and there's a small area of a capsular tear and we're trying to get some cortex out and what's happening right there? Vitreous. Vitreous, exactly. And so I, I was under the mistaken impression that I thought the hyloid face was still intact, which I was which we allowed the resident to go ahead and to remove that nucleus because we thought the hyloid face was intact. But 
if you look now, you can see that there's this oval opening in the posterior capsule and there's this little strand of vitreous coming forward. So now we have to change what we're gonna do now because with that strand of vitreous coming forward, we just can't, can't go on. And so what does the panel recommend we do at this point? I think we need to inject the viscode before we withdraw and then inject uh, preservative free tramsinoramide to recognize the presence of vitreous and whether it's prolapsed through the tail and then decide the strategy for retraction. Yeah, I agree with Abe. I mean, it's really difficult to tell how much of a posterior capsular violation uh, we have here. Um, it could the, the viscoelastic could not only help protect the cornea, keep back the vitreous from coming forward further, but also help us to get that pupil just a little bit bigger so we can see how much loss of capsular integrity we have. I can't really tell from the video, maybe it was more obvious in person um, how large this, this area is. In person, it was an oval opening that was approximately three millimeters by by well, maybe two and a half by, by one and a half millimeters. So it was not that big of an opening. The rest of the capsule was intact at this point. Now, unfortunately, not only did we not have Omidria available at the VA hospital that day, we did not have any triamcinolone available. And so we are proceeding here. So now we are trying to regurgitate so that that strand comes out. Now, again, for the third time, what did we do? We did not put our OVD in. So three times we make the same know. mistake. Obviously, I'm not very well trained here on, on training someone else to do this. So we made two stab incisions. We made a second stab incision, and now we're doing a bimanual vitrectomy anteriorly. Now, I know Dr. Vasavada has wonderful videos of working through the pars plana and removing the vitreous posteriorly, where it probably makes more physiologic sense. But... Unfortunately, I'm just not comfortable with the resident going through the um, pars planus. So we made a second stab incision. We did not go through the main incision. Now, finally, the fourth time, we figure out that you should put OVD in before you come out. And what we found is that the capsulotomy anteriorly was still intact. So what we're doing is we're putting OVD in, we're reforming the ciliary sulcus. Now, we have to extend the wound to about three millimeters because we're gonna now put a three-piece lens in the sulcus. And so it's important, you really cannot get that big B cartridge in through a 2.4 millimeter incision. So when we go in, we rotate the injector sideways, we slide that haptic into the ciliary sulcus. And then as the three-piece acrylic lens is coming out, we then roll the bevel down, taking great care to not let that haptic go into the capsular bag, and then slowly unfold the optic. Again, I apologize for the centration, but you kind of get the idea of what we go through when we're at the working with residents every week. So now what we do is we gently rotate that haptic, the second haptic, into the ciliary sulcus. How are those eyelashes? Yes, again, we didn't, we didn't properly drape. We could have put more tegaderm on there or something, but now we go back in, we're removing our OVD, taking great care not to extend anything. And you can see now, I'm sorry, I didn't show you where we optic captured, we optic capture. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop that there. What I wanna do is I just wanna highlight some points of what we did wrong on that case. So when you're suspecting a potential capsular tear, never come out of the eye. Always keep your either IA or phaco handpiece into the main wound, go through the stab incision, place your OVD, then come out of the eye. If you have poor pupil dilation, that is an invitation for problems because you can't really see what you're doing. And so do not hesitate at that point to put some iris hooks in to widely dilate that pupil to control the floppiness of the iris. Um, in terms of seeing if there's any vitreous there, I think triamcinolone is a wonderful tool to use and that will really stain those strands of vitreous. And then last but not least, if you're going to remove the vitreous and you're not comfortable in the pars plana, 
what you can do is you can make a second stab incision. Don't go through your main incision, go through your stab incision and go ahead and remove any strands of vitreous. So I can go ahead and, and just ask the panel just to jump in and make any comments at this point. Yeah, Nick, I, I think that case may have taken a couple years off your, your life. Um, I think it was maybe more stressful than it had to be. You know, I, usually I tell the residents that I, they saved my gym membership because my heart rate goes <laughs> to 150 when I'm with them without even having to do an elliptical. Yeah, you don't I, even have to do a stress test. You don't have to go get a stress test. You're fine. Right, right. right. Yeah. But I agree with Nick, you know, they should practice with iris hooks or malugan rings before they come into the OR. So they have a little bit of familiarity, even just watching videos, you know, I mean, videos like these or other videos are just such a great tool to help them kind of warm up in advance for cases, because we know we're going to get cases like this all the time where the pupil doesn't dilate. So I usually tell the fellows and residents, if you think about it, you know, wanting to use it, for example, hooks or tripan, and it's going to make your life easier. Just do it. You know, it's not only good practice, it can save you some stress. Um, and also the other thing about uh, the second incision for the vitrectomy, I thought that was a great point. I usually try to make my stab incision, my second stab incision, a little further away from the wound. So I can bring the vitreous a little further away and it's not coming toward the main wound. But that was a very good point about not not doing your vitrectomy through the main wound. And a myostat, I think, is a nice tool to make sure that if you don't have Kenalog or in combination with Kenalog to make sure your pupil comes down round and put a 10 nylon, I would say. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to comment on, Kendall, is that you have an open capsule case to so make sure, I hope at the VA they have intracameral antibiotics that you can use. They do indeed. Um, Fortunately, we do have intracameral preservative-free moxifloxacin that's mixed up there, so we can use that. Um, in terms of rings, they, they've got a great experience using Malugan rings, and this was the one where we all we fell for the problem where the pupil is initially well dilated, and so we we always say, well, that'll be okay. It's well enough dilated. We don't need a Malugan ring. And um, the residents were before the Malugan rings were available were very good at putting hooks in, and now unfortunately they're not. So that's an area we should probably stress in wet labs is is getting proficiency in using hooks. Hey Ned, can you uh, put the video back to where it was right before you started the CCC? I guess it's the beginning of your case, and I I mean I think we we've, we've all been here. We're all going to be here this week, this month, where uh, you know you sit down and you go. <clears throat> Well, the pupil's not widely dilated, but it looks adequate. And uh, then you get away with it and you say, well, you know, I'm pretty good at these medium pupils. And I think the key is, of course, here, you know, the patient on tamsulosin, uh, it's not going to stay that way. And so uh, it really points out your case is beautiful. It points out the importance of making that decision uh, before you even get started. Uh, because as you uh, said, once you get into it, like right there, you know, yep. that's that's a case where uh, it looks like, you know, for many cases, we'd be fine. I think the key was knowing they were on tamsulosin. And, uh, you know, I think that I think that is a, that is a great point. And so I'm not quite the 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 showman that Dr. Agarwal is. And he would say, oh, my God, what am I doing here? How can I do that? How did I not see that? And these are the ones where whenever you're when you're in there, you don't quite notice it. And when you look back at the videos, when you review the videos with the resident, then you say, oh, we should have done this. We should have put a ring in there. And they're actually getting quite good at putting in Malugan rings. We use that quite a lot. And so, um, yes, in retrospect, we probably should have started with the ring. That pupil is about 6.5, maybe 7. But knowing that they were on the the uh, Tamsulos, and we probably should have put a ring in, and that could have saved us a lot more difficulties during the case. All right. Well, thank no, I, you. A beautiful. One uh, point. Oh, yes, Abhi. Yeah, I think I, I find that uh, staining NG capsule with tripon glue, uh, every time with the fellows doing that, I make a point in respect of the cataract, which helps sometimes. And uh, low IOP or bottle height in uh, I feel which you all have described the importance of uh, that low fluid pressure more in the front of the iris than behind. That really helps to prevent that iris coming to the incision. But uh, Nick, wonderful uh, teaching case and uh, 
you brought out so important the pearls that people remember. Thank you. All right. Thank well, you. Nick, thank you so much. Uh, well, if you could uh, stop sharing your screen and we'll get to our next presentation uh, by Dr. Mitch Weikert. Well, Mitch is uh, pulling up his presentation, uh, you know. We, we had some questions about, you know, what kind of iris hooks to use. Go ahead, Nicole. Yeah, I like the flexible um, Alcon Grace Opera iris hooks because I can put them under my main incision. I think I learned that from you, Dr. Chang. Um, and uh, the MST hooks are also nice. Uh, they're a little stiffer. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Uh, take it away, Mitch. All right. So, uh, dense cataract, dense surgeon. So, this is an 84-year-old gentleman with a 4-plus brunescent cataract, poor dilation and tamsulosin use. So, this is our second chance here. So, uh, we're starting out with this small or medium-sized pupil. This IFIS risk will probably need capsular stain. Um, Kendall, what's your preference uh, to, for these cases from the get-go? You said for capsular stain specifically? I well, usually, and how would you approach this? You know, this, well, for, this. for this case, I would definitely use Tripan Blue. I would put in a Malugan ring, um, which is my preference. I mean, iris hooks could also be used as well, um, but I think either would be just fine, whatever a person feels more comfortable with and has access to. Great. Uh, I agree. So in this case, I'm going to use iris hooks. You can see that I mark the location of the hooks uh, beforehand, and that way I can place my Paris and TCs away from the hooks, and I know that my incisions won't interfere with each other. And inevitably, that hook to the left there is the one right where I want my Paris and TCs to be. So we want to see the whole capsule when we stain it. So I'll put the hooks in with cohesive OVD ahead of time, and then um, I'll stain the capsule and paint the capsule underneath um, and then wash out the cohesive and replace it with dispersive OBD. So right there, there was kind of a telltale sign in these dense lenses. Um, we'll come back to that in a second. But here we can see I've got kind of liquefied cortex. So, um, Nicole, what would you do at this point? Suck it out. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I mean, it's not just dense. It's it's intumescent and dense, right? So um, I usually would go in initially with a 27 gauge and then and then um, pull back on the syringe and then initiate. Yeah, and I, in retrospect, I should have gone in ahead of time with the needle. One thing that I don't know if people picked up on is when I injected the dispersive OVD, you could see the liquefied cortex being pushed to the periphery. And that's that's a great sign uh, ahead of time that you've got liquefied cortex. So you kind of know what to do with it. So um, I went in uh, with uh, the needle after I initially saw that. I tried to do it as quick as possible because you just don't want that to continue to expand. And so here, since I already had the opening in the capsule, I'm just using a cannula. Um, but luckily, everything was OK. And we could continue with our, our rexus here. And in these cases, I like to err on the side of uh, at least six millimeters for my rexus, so it's easier to get these pieces out. So I'm going to do a hydrodissection. Usually you don't need much hydrodissection since the cortex is already liquefied. It spins pretty easy. And now I'm starting my FACO. And you guys probably noticed this well ahead of me, but what do you see here? Abe, what's going on? I think it's a, it's a mobile... Uh very hard nucleus and uh, we really need to use more energy and less push mechanical as well. Yes, exactly. Um, Kendall, anything else? Yeah, I mean, I would uh, maybe even use a chop, uh, the switch to chop as opposed to trying to make a groove here, but I would definitely hike up my longitudinal power. Um, pretty significantly here, so I don't move that around, just like Abe said. I mean, we really don't want yeah. to push on these zonules. I mean, we could see that that capsule was not, it was a little more friable, and I'm sure you felt that as well. So we can kind of feel it as we start to tear the capsule around, and that's usually consistent with the zonular weakness. And I think all of these cases with dense cataracts have zonular issues as well. Yeah. Well, I do feel a little better because you guys kind of 
were delayed in recognizing what I was delayed in recognizing too. <laughs> yeah, the whiteness over the incision. So, you know, there was a wound burn. So, um, you know, Nicole, what do you do right at this point? Uh, and why did I, it happen? Well, okay. So, you know, the wound burns that I've treated and seen and, and had um, are because I have so much OBD in the eye and you hear this ding, ding, ding right when you go in and sometimes you just ignore it for some reason. Um, and that's when you should switch and go and increase your vacuum. Um, so switch and, and aspiration to, you know, clear all that dispersive out, especially in a shallow chamber eye. Um, at this point, you know, you just got to get the lens out. Um, and then you have to deal with how you're going to close this. Um, but at this point, you need to just keep going and get the lens out. I agree. So, um, you know, we're not getting much leakage out through that wound, luckily. So I'm, I'm, I'm still a divide and conquer guy, even in these dense lenses. Um, and I really kind of hate these, or I kind of still do, but the machine settings are pretty good now. So with uh, our settings, um, at least on a Stellaris that we have in our, our surgery center, uh, we can cut through these lenses pretty easy, but we still have these posterior plates to deal with that are thick. And so I agree with Kendall, I like to do chopping. Um, it's hard for me to chop a nucleus without a groove, without getting down there because of that plate. Um, but I applaud people that are more facile at doing that. So, but you gotta be really patient with these. One thing you wanna do is try to remove the piece and its connections completely. Otherwise you're gonna use a lot more ultrasound. So what protections do you uh, take Kendall when you're dealing with these really dense lenses with ultrasound? Um, well, one other tool that we might want to consider if we have it available is a MyLoop, um, which can help with these really dense lenses that have a posterior plate. Um, you know, also, I have just another note. Uh, I would have seen wound burns like this when the sleeve wasn't properly fit or there was a hole in the sleeve or the, the wrong sleeve is being used. So make sure that your equipment is uh, set ahead of time. And if you start to see a wound burn like this, take a look at your... <laughs> your FACO tip and make sure that the sleeve is, is intact and uh, is the proper sleeve. So I've definitely seen that, you know, fortunately we don't see things like this that much anymore because um, fluidics have become so much better. Um, you know, other, uh, the other thing can be how, is a, a really deep eye, you know, as you go through in a deep eye and you tip down, it can pinch off the irrigation around the FACO needle. That's a good point too. So. So yeah, we I fill with OVD a lot. So not even you know at the beginning and the end, I, I'll fill multiple times during the nuclear removal to protect that corneal endothelium. Um, sometimes I'll go in with a spatula. If I've got a connection that's really hard to break, you can actually lift up the spatula and just fake it across uh, the connection to break those pieces into smaller pieces, um, and then that can facilitate uh, your removal. You know if you. If you're able to really divide the nucleus up, they're usually not that bad. The problem comes when you can't separate the pieces, I think. So uh, we got the nucleus out here, our capsule's intact, so everything's going well. This shows that my loop that Kendall was talking about. Um, I think we've all seen these before, but this is another dense lens. It's a basically a nitinol snare that we can pass around the lens. Um, so we'll see, we'll uh, expand the snare to the right, and then we'll sweep it around the lens. We'll go a little bit past midline and then come back. We'll use a second instrument because as you start to contract this snare, uh, the lens wants to pull out of the capsule. So you can see here, we'll go in, I'll cover the, the distal part of the lens here as we're contracting that snare and it's slicing through the lens. Um, I really love this because you now have, now you don't have to deal with those posterior connections because you're really cutting the lens from the back to the front. And usually two passes is enough with a lens like this. Um, and then once we have the lens separated in the quadrants, uh, it, the removal is, is a piece of cake. Um, so you, a couple of things you have to be careful for. Um, the my loop is about five and a half millimeters from front to back when it's fully expanded. So if you have a really thick lens, it can be difficult to get it all the way around. You definitely want to stain your capsule, which you're going to anyway in these cases, but you want to be able to see the capsule as you're passing the loop around it. So here we are now, we're injecting the lens. 
Now we got to suture the wound. So there's many different ways to approach this. We can have the panel discuss this, but I'm going to put multiple sutures in here and I'm not going to try to close the wound completely with that first suture because that puts a lot of tension on it. I'm using 9 nylon in this case instead of 10 and I'm just working gently with these slip knots back and forth, back and forth until I can get the wound closed. Um, and then uh, seems to work there, but now I've got a leak, but it's not through the incision, it's through the suture track. So Nicole, what would you do here? Uh, cry uh, and then <laughs> get it together, get it together. You know, I mean, I learned a lot from, from you know, our mentors and, you know, when you're trying to suture these kind of sick corneas together, it's like you go from disease tissue to disease tissue, it's just going to keep leaking. And so you have to find fresh tissue, um, even if it's halfway through the cornea. Um, and, and I try and do a mattress style suture technique, or just go from fresh tissue to fresh tissue. And that's helped a lot. I agree. So this was a few years ago. So that's back when we had Rasher sealant. So I was able to use Rasher sealant to close that little bit of a leak. And it paid off. Now, you don't have this anymore, but had we still had it, I probably would have put an air bubble in the AC because if you put air up against that, it's going to really stop the leaking and you can get that sealant on there very well. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, we don't have this anymore. I've done this with even cyanoacrylate or whatever. I like, go get crazy glue, you know, and and then I see them in post-op. And then once it comes off, you you have the leak again, and now you're managing it in the office. Um, so I would just be a little careful. I've seen Lisa Arbiser actually suture it close and then make a conjunctival pyridomy and then suture that on top of it, which I thought was kind of genius. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've um, seen that as well. I mean, did you put a bandage contact lens on top of this too, Mitch? Or did you have? I did. Yeah. Yeah, I did put, and and luckily, you know, they were fine the next day and continued to do fine after that. I'm not a big fan of cyanoacrylate on top of suture yeah. material, you know, because that that really sticks and it never doesn't unstick in my experience. So that's always you're always caught between a rock and a hard place with that. But I agree with um, going through fresh tissue. Any other approaches to suturing an incision with a wound burn? Do you make any relaxing incisions, anything like that? But I no, agree just a, with Nick's comments about the mattress suture may be a little bit more effective than uh, interrupted 10 nylons or 9 nylons as you did here. But uh, you know, Nick mentioned pulling up the conjunctiva. If you really can't close this, I mean, that layer of conjunctiva, I have done that before and it's magical. Um, so, and it really, you know, doesn't, it can cause some astigmatism because then you're going to have to put really two 10 or 9 nylons peripherally to kind of bring that conj up over that weak area, but it works magically in a, in a case like this. I think we're destined for a little astigmatism anyway. <laughs> yeah. So uh, two questions. Uh, this is a great case, Mitch, and we'll, we'll move on soon. But uh, let's say you thought you were okay, but then at the slit lamp, uh, the pressure is uh, in single digits or close to zero, and you see, okay, you're leaking through uh, one of those suture tracks. Uh, what do you do at that point? You know, you know, you thought you're okay, and now you notice at the slit lamp on post-op day one that you've got a hypotenuse eye. What's your management? I see try to detect where the leakage might be if you can really pinpoint that area of leakage and even add glue or a contact lens. I think that can be helpful. I mean, I think we have to watch for choroidals and sometimes add atropine or timolol to decrease aqueous production and to help with the choroidals a little bit there as well. But try to identify the area where the actual leak is to see if we can, you know, close that somehow. Sounds good. And then, and then Nick, uh, uh, well, sorry, yeah. Well, Mitch, when did you take out the sutures? How long did you wait? Oh, I waited probably six weeks to take the stitches out. I wait really long time for these. And I don't take them all out at once. I'll take one or two out at a time and kind of work my way uh, out of that hole that I dug for myself. Super. Great case. Okay, great case. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Mitch. That was uh, 
Fantastic. Um, we're going to go to our third speaker, and uh, Nicole Fram is going to talk about uh, a very common problem that we don't speak about enough. Looks beautiful. Okay, great. So we're going to talk about how to navigate negative dysphotopsia, and these are my financial disclosures, just so we're all on the same um, playing field. Uh, what induces negative dysphotopsia? It's a dark arc off to the side, often present. Um, it's a shadow in the patient's vision present post-op day one, and 97% get better, um, but 3% persist. And as we talk about, they're a very vocal 3%, especially in my practice. Um, the working ray tracing theory uh, is that there's an illumination gap. So the shadow is caused by non-illuminated nasal retina that's bounded posteriorly by the intended light ray by the optic and bounded anteriorly by light rays that miss the optic. And Erie and Simpson and Holiday have done a lot of amazing work on this. The nasal capsule, as well as um, high power IOLs um, can be associated uh, with this as well. And the hypothesis is that if we can somehow move the optic forward, uh, then we can move this illumination gap outside of the, the retina to perceive it. And so that's what all the strategies have been based on. Um, this is just a, a baseline video of a secondary reverse optic capture. The work of uh, my partner, Sam Maskin, and I looked at elevating uh, the optic on top of the nasal capsule in particular, but the entire optic up and found that if we did this, and we did this mainly in the Acrosoft uh, platform, uh, that it moved the shadow uh, more anteriorly. And these patients, 96% of the time, had improvement. So you can see uh, you dissect, uh, you have to be careful of the zonule. And this Acrosoft material can lend itself to being easier to reverse optic capture. So here we had a solution of someone who was pretty happy with their surgery. You could just elevate the optics. Sometimes, depending on the power of the IOL, you'll get more of a shift. So uh, Dr. Chang's colleague, uh, Brian Lee, partner, Brian Lee, uh, read the paper and said, okay, well, I have a patient with negative dysphotopsia, and I'm going to do reverse optic capture because Dr. Maskett and Dr. Fram said that that was going to work. And this patient had reverse optic capture and came into my office and said, well, now you have to deal with it because it didn't work. And she had persistent <laughs> symptoms for about six months. And she came in and she said, I'm going to show you what helps me. And she's a lovely lady and she's not crazy. Um, she's special. Uh, but not crazy. And um, we wanted to figure out a way to help her. And I was really kind of having an issue because I'm like, well, if moving this optic didn't work, what can I do for her next? And we know from the papers, uh, the ray tracing and theoretical models that possibly changing the material and definitely moving it even more forward could help. So I offered her this solution, uh, which was that I was going to remove this IOL and put a different IOL in the sulcus now, and to move it even more forward, I would suture it to the iris. Um, so here I'm showing how you can amputate the haptics because uh, previous, I just want to show there was a, a really beautiful example of um, secondary uh, reverse optic capture. It doesn't look like a cat eye like optic capture. The optic is on top of the anterior capsule and the haptics are inside uh, the capsule bag. And they're pretty fibrosed. Uh, these, this is the Acrosoft platform, as mentioned, and it fibrosis at the terminal bulb. So we're taking MST uh, scissors and amputating. So these are 23 gauge scissors and 23 gauge serrated forceps. And then they retract back. When you amputate, just make sure that cut edge is covered by anterior capsule. And we could just leave them there because we're going to put a new lens in the sulcus. And I just removed this through a three millimeter incision. And now um, we'll put this LI61AO silicone IOL in the sulcus. Now, um, a lot of people say, you know, iris suture fixation can cause a tremendous amount of inflammation, but if the capsule is there and there's not a lot of endophacodinesis, we find that the inflammation rate is similar to any sutured IOL in general. And this patient actually had improvement. Um, so the problem is we had another patient um, come to us and they said, we read your paper. And I had a patient with a small eye, a big optic, and it was a technus platform. And we put um, the, the IOL in the reverse optic capture position, but they also caused zonulopathy, as you can see in this picture. And we're learning something about this, which is that 
in our paper, we looked at um, Acrosoft platform less than 23 diopters. We don't recommend at this point reverse optic capture of a single piece acrylic in short eyes, um, shallow chambers. And often looking at the chamber um, before surgery is also telling um, if they had a thin lens thickness and a shallow chamber, this is a, a real big caution in terms of reverse, reverse optic capture and moving more and more towards removal and replacement and putting lenses in the sulcus. This patient uh, needed to learn to live with the ND. We didn't want anything in the sulcus because of the amount of UG that she had. Um, and we were able to save the capsule bag, put in Ahmed segments. And interestingly, her dark shadow went more peripheral and more inferior. Um, so go figure, all of this is very um, multifactorial. So the treatment algorithm uh, that we have for ND or PD, um, negative dysphotopsy reverse or anterior optic capture, if it's Acrosoft or Clarion platform, less than 23 diopters in a normal eye or sulcus place. And I tend to uh, prefer iris suture fixation so it doesn't move around and also pulls things forward. And then for positive, the only thing we have available is to change the material at this point because we don't have the option of larger optics. But hopefully in the future, we'll be able to use certain uh, technology to predict who might have this uh, ahead of time and change the optic. And then the work of Erie and colleagues looking at um, a seven millimeter optic that could help us uh, tremendously in these cases. Um, I just want to finish up with one of my favorite pictures of um, Alan Crandall and David at a Park City meeting. Um, and we miss you, Alan, every day. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nicole. Actually, Nicole, I'm gonna um, have you uh, answer, uh, the audience has posed a question, uh, any tips on the capsulorexis to prevent negative dysphotopsia? And uh, a question about, orienting the haptics vertically or horizontal. I think that's Bonnie Henderson's proposal that if the haptics were <clears throat> um, on the horizontal axis, then you wouldn't have an edge. Yeah, so uh, these are great questions. So in terms of, the, we've had colleagues that say like, ever since I started making a six millimeter capsulotomy, I don't have as much ND. That's that's interesting. Um, that's based on you know the work that Maskett and I did with the nasal capsule and the implications there, but it, it seems that I've had patients that have no capsule overlap and still have negative uh, dysphotopsia. So I'm not sure that that's 100%. Um, orienting the the haptics horizontally, uh, Bonnie Henderson wrote a great paper on this. It wasn't significantly different after uh, one week. Uh, so it may decrease temporary negative dysphotopsia, and that's part of the 97% that improve, but not necessarily permanent dysphotopsia. What's interesting is that uh, Erie wrote a paper on what happen happens at the optic-haptic junction, and that there is scattering that happens there. And there are certain IOLs like the CT Lucia 621 that has a broader optic-haptic uh, junction that may it may be that if we put those horizontally, we'll get a decreased incidence. So I, I think it's something that we still need to, to look at. Uh, uh, good answers. I want to go back to one more point. If you're putting a three-piece in the sulcus, um, you know, can you clarify what if the surgeon isn't secure about iris suture fixation of the haptics and they want to do CCC capture, which we normally do with uh, yeah. a three-piece in the sulcus, will that have any chance of working or, or is it again? I think it's, you know, I think it's the same concept that it may move it out and down a little bit, much like if we, if, if I have someone, I had a case where there was a very high power IOL. I didn't want anything in the sulcus and I was stuck. I couldn't do reverse optic capture. I couldn't do anything. So I did a nasal capsulectomy based on Folden and Cook. Um, when they cut the nasal capsule with relaxing incisions for about four to five clock hours, there was about a 65% improvement. And that's consistent with what we're seeing where it moves out and down. Um, and I think it's because that optics does move forward a little bit. Um, but if you do optic capture, you're not going to get the effect, um, especially, you know, you're not going to move the optic forward enough to allow for the light rays to miss the nasal retina. Uh, Cole, I really appreciate the work that, that you and Sam Maskett have done on these negative dysphotopsies. And so 
my treatment strategy has changed a little bit on these severe negative dysphotopsias that I can't really do anything to make them better. I'm buying them a plane ticket to Los Angeles. So thanks for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. I, I care about these people. Everybody says I don't see it. You know, I see a lot of it. <laughs> I think we all do. And and my I think my last question would be, uh, what are your tips in terms of counseling people? Because obviously not every, most people don't need a surgical uh, procedure, but people are going to come in all the time with this early on. Uh, any tips on what seems to uh, work best in terms of counseling people? That's a great question. I think the first thing you do if they say it, because they'll go like this. I mean, they'll just say everything's great. It only happens with perfect surgery. It's better with dilation. And what you say, I say initially, I know what you have. I look at the retina. I do a visual field to make sure there's nothing neurological or anything that I'm missing. And when you just tell them, we know what you have, 97% get better and like play a Jedi mind trick on them, then, you know, hopefully it'll go away. But if it doesn't, you reassure them that I will, I have strategies that could help you um, because, you know, it's more common in left eyes. Sometimes it's bilateral. Sometimes you're stuck and you have anisometropia and you have to do the other eye. You can do primary reverse optic capture with a three piece, not a one piece in the other eye. Um, so there are things you can do to help. How long do you wait? That's always the... I wait at least six months, um, you know, at least. And, and, oh, the other pearl is that I asked them initially after the first week or so, is it coming and going? Is it in different lighting? And if it's coming and going, this hasn't been published yet. Um, I believe that they're neuroadapting. Um, so I do think that it's very reassuring when you hear them say, well, it's only in certain lighting. Well, it's not there all the time. Perfect. That was a, a, a terrific uh, set of cases and thanks for uh, presenting those. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Kendall Donaldson. And so Kendall, whenever you're ready, uh, you can take us to your case. I wanted to share a, a case that I was somewhat traumatized by, but um, I wanted to talk about tra a traumatic cataract today. And um, this is a young lady who was 21 years old and um, was actually involved in a dispute with her mother. She is, uh, the 21 year old girl is developmentally delayed. She's on about the level of a seven year old. And so she did get an, uh, an argument with her mother and they were flipping around the um, cord to the TV and the cord to the TV kind of hit her in the, in the eye and um, basically dehiss the iris superiorly. So you can see this iridodialysis here and um, caused a cataract, a lot of fibrotic reaction. She had seen three other providers and they said it was not repairable. She um, was not responding to light in the side, but again, she was developmentally delayed and uh, was on the level of a seven year old. So we did do a B scan. Um, we looked for a reverse APD, there wasn't one. The B scan looked pretty normal. Our neuro ophthalmologist got on board. It looked like she should have pretty good visual potential. So normally I wouldn't operate on a potentially NLPI, but we, we did proceed with surgery um, because we weren't really sure. We didn't want to write off this eye. And um, anyway, so I wanted to share this video with you. And uh, at the end, if you guys can tell me what you would have done differently, but uh, here it is, I sped it up pretty significantly. So basically I'm doing a pyridomy here and I'm gonna start by repairing the iris because at this point, the iris is so disorganized. I'm trying to break this case down into simple steps and I have to get the iris out of the way before we can work on the cataract itself. So I'm making a couple paracentesis because I'm gonna try to use viscoelastic here to kind of dissect the, uh, the iris off of the anterior capsule, which I'm assuming is violated and kind of has all become one with the cataract itself. You know, I also am using the dispersive viscoelastic to protect the corneal surface because obviously I'm manipulating a lot here and you want to take a look on your um, IOL master to check the depth of the anterior chamber and even um, do a specular microscopy to check the cell depth when you're doing a lot of work in the anterior chamber. So here, we're just making some scleral flaps, and this could be done in a number of ways. You can either make scleral flaps or use a Hoffman pocket here to repair this iris and pass your sutures out um, through the sclera. So she's bleeding more than I was expecting at this point, but um, making the pyridomy a little bit larger. And I'm going to pass the 
the proline sutures here um, in two locations, so making another scleral flap here, but just trying to get everything set before I pass this tenoproline. Um, it's a double armed tenoproline. And you know, we saw earlier, you should always mark your parasitesis ahead of time, which is what I didn't do there. So we were trying to find it. Makes it easier to relocate it when you have to. So passing that uh, CIF needle there. And um, right out about a millimeter and a half behind the limbus. And again, now I actually am getting somewhat of a pupil. And I think repairing iris defects is really kind of fulfilling and, and, and fun um, because it really can make a big difference. And of course, this pupil is going to be a tonic long term, but um, we're now creating a space where we can handle this cataract. So, and this isn't a very difficult thing to do. So these are just simple steps when you break it down. And um, now we're going to have a pupil again. So of course, any traumatic cataract is a bit unpredictable in its behavior. So we have to be prepared for everything in a case like this. You know, so we have several different IOLs, including an AC IOL, a one piece, a three piece a PC IOL. Um, I have a Zeiss CT Lucia to be prepared to do a Yamani. So I'm using uh, several tools because I want to make this easier. Um, we use Tripan Blue here and um, now we're replacing that with dispersive viscoelastic. So I can just see everything is sort of fibrotic. We have one mass here, so we just made our 2.5 millimeter keratome incision. Now I'm going to try to make a capsulotomy, which I'm expecting to be difficult. I'm running into a lot of fibrosis here. Um, so a lot of times, you know, using some of the disposable retinal scissors and things like that can be helpful. Um, always pulling toward the center because it could potentially uh, behave irregularly. Um, I like to err on the side of a smaller capsule rexus. Again, this is a 21 year old patient. So I'm expecting this to be a pretty soft lens that I'm basically gonna be able to suck out. But again, you can see we're running into fibrosis in the capsule, in the capsule here. So definitely not normal. And we get a very irregular capsulotomy. So a lot of times you may have to come back and and pull it around again to try to make that a little more regular. Um, but also now we're just trying to loosen up the lens within the capsular bag. And we were not able to FACO this lens. So a lot of this was just fibrosis within the lens material and the capsular bag. So we're using a vitractor here. Um, there's no vitreous loss. I'm just using it to kind of eat away at that fibrotic material and even opening up the capsule to a more normal round uh, opening. So I'm still not really sure what kind of lens we're gonna put in this eye at this point. But again, we're kind of prepared for everything. And I assume I'm gonna to have to do a vitrectomy here, but looking at it at this point, the capsular bag is still intact, but it happens to be really fibrotic at the periphery of the capsular bag. And we're thinking that this is not going to be a stable capsule. So we're going around and kind of loosening up the sulcus at this point and decided to put a three-piece IOL in the sulcus because uh, we didn't really want to take a chance. And we had a good space there for the sulcus at this point, which was I, I was really happy to see, but uh, also surprised at the same time. But we felt we had a reasonable space there. So we put this lens in the sulcus. Essentially got pretty lucky. Um, but again, you know, a couple of things that I didn't do here that we probably should have done is we have this atonic pupil, which is larger than average. So I wish I took uh, some of the retinal forceps that are disposable, grease hover forceps or MST, and pulled down on the iris all the way around to try to bring this pupil down a little bit more. So just kind of securing the wound here. But fortunately, we've got a nice three-piece lens over her visual axis and just uh, closing that pyridomy uh, here with some gut suture, retina style. So that's pretty much the case. Um, and let me just show you the outcome here. Again. Gotta love having two screens. Uh, so she was a 2050 uh, post-op week one after surgery. Um, and she, you know, we were 
just uh, very impressed and happy to see that she had some visual potential. She ended up being 2025. And you can see here her IOL is not centered. Um, her iris is, is also irregular. Um, she was complaining of some glare, but again, she's very developmentally delayed and um, she was functioning well. And uh, so overall, everything went well. But I think there are a few things I, I could have done differently. So let me stop sharing here and maybe the panel could help me out on some recommendations about what they would have done if they would have gone further with, you know, iris repair, um, you trusted that sulcus. Um, you know, Mitch, what advice would you have given me or what would you maybe have done differently to help the outcome of this case? I mean, fortunately, the vision is good. It's not the most beautiful outcome. Um, I think it's a great outcome. <laughs> um, congrats. You know, that's an amazing outcome, actually. Um, I kind of agree. I think sometimes more is less. I, I wouldn't have maybe gone after all that iris repair in the initial surgery. That's something you can always come back and do later. You can see how the iris is to work with later, how the lens is sitting. Because if you start to repair that iris and close that pupil and then the lens is unstable or has problems later, then you got to open it back up to deal with it. So I, I think you made a great decision there. Um, one thing I did notice, you know, in the, uh, the biometry at the beginning, you could see the spikes for the lens were very close together. So the lens thickness was very small. So you kind of knew that material was already being resorbed there. Uh, I think it's amazing that you didn't have a bigger capsule defect because, you know, I imagine somewhere the capsule was violated and all that to get that lens material to be reabsorbed like it was. But no, I think it's an outstanding outcome. Kendall, I think you made a really good point initially that, that I want to stress is that um, marking the paracentesis when you're suturing that iris, because we've all had times where we put in the second suture beautifully, we catch the iris, we pull it out, we realize it's not pulling through. And you got a little tiny bit of the you know, cornea on there on that needle when you're first going through. So if you mark it, make sure it'll save you having to pull that out and, and starting all over again. And then the second thing, I think it's Mike Snyder who makes this point is using a micro forceps to kind of hold the iris when you're pushing that needle through will we'll let you get it through the iris a little bit easier than, than pulling it and then poking it through. And so I think something to give you a little bit of counter-traction will allow you to put that needle through the iris uh, more easily. I'll say Ashvin Agarwal showed a nice technique using a trocar opposite where he wanted to pass the sutures out of the eye at ASCRS. And um, it allowed him to pass that needle across the anterior chamber um, and then make sure that, or it makes it easy not to tag the cornea when you're doing that double arm suture throw. So uh, it, it's a good technique. Mm -hmm. yeah. Abe? Yeah, I think uh, three things. One, I use 9-O proline now instead of 10-O, but both are very good. And you showed it beautifully how to suture the dialysis and the outcome was fabulous. But in a traumatic cataract with anterior capsule split or a large one, I try to do PCCC if the Posture capsule doesn't have much of a fibrosis. And then capture the optic, putting these haptic into the ciliary sulcus or in the bag, because they, they come out sometimes with the empty capsule split. But this was a different case. So I think that 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 really is what I do normally. But wonderful, excellent outcome. That was a great case. I, I'll uh, add a point. Sometimes with a fibrotic capsule, you just can't tear it. So uh, one can do a can opener uh, sometimes just to get through it because in the end, really what you needed was the posterior capsule. Uh, but to Mitch's point, in young people, there's no nucleus and sometimes it's just liquid. And as you start your uh, can opener, the fluid all comes out. And so I, I've done this where I simultaneously did a can opener posterior capsulotomy because you basically go right through. So keep that in mind with the young traumatic uh, cataracts. Uh, and of course, young people are often uh, disproportionately the patients with these uh, cases. Yeah. Right. Abe, last comment. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, that, that, like I said, the sulcus wasn't completely normal and we had to reopen it. And I did have some trouble post-operatively with CME. And I felt like she had a little bit of uveitis uh, that went on um, long, about three months, honestly. So I think there may have been, um, you know, irritation and just took longer to heal. So being aware that these patients can get CME in these complicated cases, um, you know, just keep them on drops a lot longer. <clears throat> Great points. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Kendall. Uh, so we have uh, one more case, and then I'll just remind the audience that the last portion of the symposium is really dedicated to question and answer. So uh, please uh, um, type in questions for that section. Uh, so our last case is uh, presented by Dr. Abhay Visavada. Well, uh, I'm not sure whether it's uh, relevant to this financial interest on this presentation, uh, and recognize the colleagues at Raguti Bai Hospital. The question is, when should I operate? And I typically wait for three years of age because I find that it's more complicating. And I think uh, a good time taken during examination of anesthesia is something which is very important. And UVM, B scan, and whatever else really uh, allows us to strategize the the program or, or the plan for the surgery. I'm trying to remove this bar that I'm having here now. Just hold on. Come here and do it. Well, uh, the challenges for the surgeons are two, really. Preservate, preservation of the bag and parts plana lensectomy and vitrectomy. So I think uh, uh, what I would prefer in a sublux is the preservation of the bag, unless the the subluxation is very severe. Now, IOL fixation is something we need to keep in mind and for preservation of the bag, in the bag is something which I find uh, as routine. First thing is to make sure that there is no vitreous before you proceed and make a small parasynthesis and use preservative tramps in alone uh, into the eye. Uh, next thing would be to tamponite vitreous phase, and I use the soft shell technique of uh, using uh, dispersive viscoat in the open area, and then use heel on GV or heel on phi sometimes, a cohesive viscoelastic to, to manipulate the capsular uh, opening. Uh, then would be the, just hold on, there is some issues here in my presentation. All right. Then is the hydrodissection and the viscodissection, the fluid dissection first using the cold cannula of Dr. Akahoshi, and then using this coat now so that the bag, the posterior capsule is protected. And then removing the soft lens material would be easy. For me, bimanual approach is a routine and swapping the irrigation and aspiration port after injecting. Uh, dispersive viscoelastic. So every time you take it out, inject uh, dispersive viscoelastic and by manual with appropriate bottle height really ensures in a stabilized bag. And typically I use what uh, was mentioned earlier by Nicole and others, the dry shaber iris hooks, but you can always use the capsule stabilizing hooks. I, I find this good enough. And then uh, because the Rex is a small generally, and now that I have uh, empty bag and less pressure, I try to enlarge to an appropriate size to prevent uh, fibrosis and easy implantation. So once again, using the retinal scissors and taking time under cohesive viscoelastic and making an opening, uh, focusing and uh, taking my time lifting that fibrotic capsule up as well as to the center allows me a good opening. And then using Sioni ring, and if the, the subluxation or if the zonal loss is 50% or more, as you saw in this case, I use double uh, element Sioni ring, but you can have an option of single with uh, amid segmental thing. But uh, that, that kind of two point fixation is, I think is uh, mandatory in these extensive ectopia lentis, and I, I take a flex uh, to make sure that the knots don't get exposed because Gore-Tex is very inflammatory 
and that produced granuloma if they're the knots are exposed. So I bury it under under sclerophyll. I know there are many other techniques, and you, as long as you bury it, it's fine. So uh, that's what is my technique, and we published that the management, which was quite satisfactory using the Gore-Tex and uh, uh, flap situation, but monitoring them with the all kinds of investigation, glaucoma and stability and, and, and posterior segment is very important. If the subluxation is very gross, as you can see here in this case, uh, lensectomy is an obvious option. And I, I do myself with irrigation and, and uh, parts plan of vitrectomy. But if you have a retinal colleague, obviously that would be much better. What I do is I inject a cohesive heavy viscoelastic. I injected helon 5 here in top of the lens and vitrectomy and irrigation there. The lens remains there, it won't move, and you don't have to chase it because I call it a sandwich lensectomy, helon 5 in front and irrigation from the back, and you can use the appropriate uh, vitrectomy cut. So then IOL fixation would depend on various things, iris fixation or transcleral fixation or intrascleral fixation, uh, whatever you're familiar with uh, works well. I have two options, either Gore-Tex uh, scleral fixation using, uh, uh, once again, PMMA lens with an eyelet inside, uh, Gore-Tex under the flap, like the Sioni thing, and then uh, it works quite well. It needs a larger incision and meticulous closing at the end, but I also now resort to Yamani technique in, in where I end up doing lensectomy. My preference would be preservation of the bag, but if I feel that uh, this needs a lensectomy, I do straight away. And I use uh, uh, some kind of modification of uh, the original Yamane technique, but it's principally the same, producing a mushroom so that uh, that holds that. And I, I thread the leading, the trailing haptic by bringing the needle out. I use this very on uh, marking system to make sure that the alignment of both ends are same. And if there is a difference, I change the penetration, uh, the final second sterile penetration of the trailing haptic according. I use the heat cautery, which is a very simple thing, but, but then uh, it, it looks uh, quite okay. So we have uh, the options of, uh, a preservation of the bag and lensectomy with various uh, IOL fixation options. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Very nice, Abe. Uh, any uh, comments, panel? Nicole, I know you're you're going to have to leave a, a little early. Any any comments you want to get in? I you know I think it's just. You know, every time I watch your surgery, it is just such beautiful surgery. The only comment about the iris hooks is that sometimes they're not polished. They don't go all the way out to the equator. So, you know, the uh, MST Chang modified um, uh, capsule retractors or the McCool sometimes work a little bit better. Um, mm -hmm. But sometimes it's so far that the only thing that'll reach are the iris hooks. So I understand that usage. I think you showed um, the centration using digital marking just beautifully. Um, and I think in these cases where you're going to have to trim a lot with these pediatric cases, it's it's going to be even more important. So I'm, I'm taking that pearl with me. Mm -hmm. You know, Thanks. Abe, you showed something that was interesting. You didn't even mention it. Capsulotomy in, in children is difficult because the capsule is extremely elastic. And I always tell my pediatric colleagues that kids are like rabbits, and, and they really are. And so when we do research work in rabbits, doing the capsulotomy, you really have to pull to the center. It's almost like a Brian Little technique all the way around. And I noticed when you were showing the capsulotomy that you were pulling to the center when you extended that rather than pulling around. And I think it's critical in these younger people with the elastic capsule that that's how you do your capsulotomy so it doesn't run out. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for being here. Um, I'll often use uh, uh, CTR and CT segments in these kids. And sometimes when they're so dislocated, I have to put the CT segment in first and pull the capsule over before I can 
insert the CTR. And that, that's worked well for me in the past too. Um, and then uh, I use Gore-Tex as well. Um, I'll typically make a little groove and then try to bury the knot um, and let the suture lay in that groove. Um, I've seen uh, uh, Steve Saffron make a kind of a shield groove between his two sclerotomies. So the whole suture is covered by a little bit of sclera, but it's not quite a full flap. So all those techniques work well because as you said, the one thing we worry about is that Gore-Tex eroding through the sclera over time. So you need kind of a thicker flap, 350 microns, I think is pretty good thickness for that flap that overlies any Gore-Tex with a knot. But, you know, the, the, we have some audience uh, questions really about this general topic of IOL fixation without capsular support. So um, someone is uh, asking about nylon or proline for suturing uh, to the sclera. And uh, can you go through a little bit more of the rationale and uh, where you can obtain Gore-Tex? Anyone want to take that? Uh yeah, Abe, uh, you know, you... Yeah, I'm, I'm using, I forgot the name of the company, but but uh, uh, it's available in the USA only, I believe. So we need to kind of all other pe persons internationally has to get it from there. And uh, it's a 7 Gore-Tex thick. It's a rope, it's a very long thread. And you need to cut the needles and, and use the 25 gauge uh, forceps to to thread it and take it out with the sclerotomy. But if you want to use proline, 5-0 proline is something that uh, uh, would uh, long last very long. 9-0 and 10-0 will degrade with time. Um, Someone brought up um, nylon in the question too. Um, nylon will not last. Uh, nylon will break down rapidly. Proline will break down, especially Tenno. And so even Nino eventually will break down because it is in the um, you know vascularized tissue when you're doing fixation with it. So don't use nylon. And if you're going to use proline, go to at least a Nino. And the thing is, is, is these are children. And so, you know, the suture has to last um, 60, 70 years. And so we will see what's going to happen with these over time. Um, so uh, one thing we don't have in the U.S., but is more available internationally, is <clears throat> iris claw IOL. So what about retropupillary implantation of that? That's Dr. Westfall asking. I think iris claw lens is a very good idea, uh, as long as it is in the posterior chamber. In other words, it's behind the iris, because uh, quite often, because of the movement. Uh, uh, it can, over a period of time, can impact the endothelial cell count. So uh, posteriorly, retro iris fixation would be a good option. You're, mu you're muted, Kendall. Good question. That was a, a terrific case. Um, you know, I know you chose to use a one-piece IOL, but your opinions about one-piece versus three-piece IOLs in some of these complex cases, just in case we have to go back in later if something gets dislodged, or do you, and also do you feel like the haptics of, of a three-piece lens maybe add some uh, structure to the capsular bag? Do you ever use a three-piece versus a, a one-piece? I know you put the one-piece in the bag there. Yeah, but I, I do use three-piece IOL uh, quite often now, but but if it dislocates, if there is a zonulopathy and the bag IOL complex dislocates, I find that uh, centration and stability is not that great when I re-suture the bag complex. So recently now, uh, with the help of a retinal colleague combined co-management, we removed the entire thing and used Yamani technique. But but that's a very good option and I've tried it and it generally works quite well. So three-piece is a good idea to start with, so I agree. Great. Uh, <clears throat> another question uh, from Dr. Farr, do you recommend Zepto or Femto for a capsulotomy in a subluxated cataract? Well, uh, if the subluxation is mild, 
where the tilt of the lens is not much, you can do whatever, a flex or a, or yard, whatever technique you have. But generally, if it is a gross subluxation, the focusing is not that uniform and you end up with a weaker capsule. So I, I've given up on the femto uh, capsulotomy in a moderate to grossly subluxated lens. It, it really is not predictable. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw in a comment about uh, Zepto, which is uh, uh, using a, a suction-based uh, application of energy through a nitinol ring. And you actually don't want to do it in a subluxated cataract because of the fact that there's vacuum uh, applied. So it'll probably, uh, you know, you may worsen the uh, zonulopathy uh, due to that. And the suction does draw the capsule up microscopically so that's probably a contraindication it actually uh can work very nice in the case that kendall showed where you have uh, some fibrosis because it's using not cautery but uh, a mechanical energy due to vaporization of fluid between the nitinol ring and the capsule so it can actually cut through um, a little bit of fibrosis of course it could be too thick eventually but uh, you're no worse off because if it doesn't go through, you can uh, essentially have scored the, the, uh, the capsule. Um, let's see, uh, Abe, uh, the, Dr. Pollock is asking, uh, how do you prepare the triamcinolone before you inject it? Well, <clears throat> it's a four milligram per ml, so I dilute it and make it, uh, I use the tubercle and syringe and uh, Take one ml concentrated and use it straight away. Okay, good. I think that if you um, you know don't have the commercial brand available, uh, you can uh, uh, use the uh, the one that's uh, you know it's Kenalog brand Triamcinolone, but. Uh, you don't want to inject the the fluid because that's osmotically not uh, correct for the anterior chamber. So you can let the flakes uh, have the bottle sit, let all the uh, suspended flakes sink to the bottom. You can pull off as much of the diluent as possible and then add a BSS to the bottle. Uh, and that's uh, one way if you don't have the uh, commercial uh, version available. And the concentration, of course, isn't really that important uh, uh, because you're really just uh, staining the vitreous by suspending flakes uh, in that. Um, another question, I think, Abe, for that last case, um, how do you calculate the IOL power uh, in these cases, I presume with a subluxated lens, but maybe in your pediatric cases in general? And then... Uh, well, yeah. I think... The, the this is a growing eye, and over eighty five percent of the adult actual length is achieved by eighteen months to twenty four months. So any the sublux case in generally ectopia would be more than three years. So I undercorrect by ten percent, not very much. Great. And uh, how do you how did you close the main incision? I I, I presume. I mean, it's a good question and that there's low scleral rigidity in pediatric cases and uh, uh, pleurocorneal incision may not close as easily. No, I, I take uh, one millimeter width means one suture. So if usually I end up with 3.2 millimeter keratome. So I take three sutures, 10 o nylon, not vicryl, and also two paracentesis of 1.1 also will need a 10 or nylon. And I remove this with the first EUA, which will be from four to six weeks time, because we, I don't want too much of astigmatism. So I, I don't use Vicryl because they break and they irritate and the mother gets worried, the mucus collects at those fragments. So I, 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 because I do EUA anyway, I, I don't mind removing it at that time. But as many sutures as necessary. Okay, great. Um, we have a couple questions for uh, Kendall's case, which was the traumatic cataract. Uh, you know, one being 
managing glaucoma uh, if they're uh, not only in this specific case, but maybe more uh, in a general sense. So Anyone I, the panel? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Kendall. Yeah, certainly any case of a traumatic cataract that also uh, affects the iris can lead to glaucoma and a lot of scar tissue within the angle. You know, obviously, certainly we start with drops. Um, if we need to, I don't do glaucoma surgeries myself, but sometimes uh, they may need a tube even uh, down the road. And sometimes it can be concomitant, but uh, usually it would be staged. And in this patient, we really didn't have troubles with the pressure, but, um, you know, sometimes I do combine procedures with my glaucoma colleagues and we would put in, you know, an Ahmed that could be effective more immediately or a bar valve that would take about six weeks to open. So, you know, with the uveitic glaucoma, which is the most common type of glaucoma we see with trauma cases, uh, they do respond well with tubes. So fortunately, my patient didn't need a tube. You know, another a question that someone wrote in about with my case was regarding an iris cerclage to bring that pupil down to a more normal level. I haven't been doing, I've done only a couple of cerclages in the past and haven't really done them recently be, thanks to um, Amar Agarwal and his fourth row pupiloplasty because I find that that's just such an easy technique. We didn't use it in this case and I kind of talked about that, uh, how the pupil wasn't beautiful in this case, but it was very functional and the patient did well. But if I were going to try to work on that pupil a little bit more, I would have considered a fourth row pupiloplasty. Um, you know, with a large iridodialysis, you have to be careful as well because you're putting more tension on the iris root there that's not really stable in the area of the, ir the iridodialysis. But, you know, I think that the fourth row pupiloplasty is a, just takes three minutes really. And it's a really nice technique that Amar um, Agarwal has kind of publicized and has some great videos online um, if anyone wants to, to learn how to, how to do that. But really helpful technique and much easier than a cerclage. Yeah, and I think the key is that uh, just an interrupted uh, uh, suture is, uh, even if you put in two on a very dilated pupil, the pupil ends up being round just because of the circumferential of the uh, iris dilator muscle. What uh, suture do you use both for the pupiloplasty and the uh, iridodialysis repair? So I use a 10 nylon um, on a CIF needle is what I used in that, in that video, but the 10 nylon is, is what I use. How about you? Yeah, I, I also, uh, for I think for the iridodialysis, I tend to use the transscleral needle, which is a little sharper, uh, which you can, uh, they're, they're a little many different ways to do it, but you can dock it into uh, a, an externally placed uh, uh, caps, uh, you know, disposable 25 needle, but I think 10 seems to work well. Yeah. Nick, would you agree with the longevity of that? Uh, different from an IOL fixation, right? You know, I think that that the iris is, is not going to be under the tension that the, um, you know, that an IOL is going to be under. And so, Oftentimes in a, in a um, iris, when you're fixating at a, a tenno will be adequate. Although, again, we don't know what's going to happen in, in 50 years, but yeah, I think a tenno in this setting is okay. You don't need to go to a nino. Yeah, I haven't seen them tear loose after years like we see with the IOL dislocations. I'm wondering if there may be some scar tissue induced out there in the periphery where we you know, pass the sutures you know, through the edge of the, the sclera there. So I haven't seen it tear through forward 10 years later, like we do with IOLs. Yeah, and a, a nice adjuvant treatment is the uh, intraocular diathermy, uh, which you can use to place kind of mid peripheral spots around to dilate certain areas of the iris if you want to really round it out. You know, Ike Ahmed taught us that, it's a great technique. That's a really good point, because um, a lot of times it can centralize your pupil, you know, much very yeah. easily. Yeah. We had a, a bunch of questions actually about IFAS. Actually, two of the five cases were uh, IFAS. Uh, and um, one of them is uh, atropine. I think Nicole uh, uses that. Um, you know, one question that always comes up is do you uh, stop the uh, tamsulosin? And I think if the patient's been on it for you know, six years and their pupil doesn't dilate. Of course, in that situation, it doesn't help, but often you do get a moderate dilation. 
uh, and I have found that uh, it does help. There's really two mechanisms. There's some permanent atrophy of the dilator muscle. That's why stopping it alone uh, isn't reliable, but there obviously is a receptor blockade that you're going to alleviate by stopping for uh, 72 hours. And uh, one thing I have uh, been doing is because often to do both eyes, uh, you know, you're, you're going to do that over maybe a four week period is um, we asked the patient's uh, PCP to switch them to Tadalafil. Tadalafil is the generic for uh, the brand of Cialis. So it's used for erectile dysfunction, but um, it actually is a non-alpha blocker that works for the lower urinary tract symptoms of BPH. And uh, I'm aware of at least one fairly large study where patients were randomized to Tamsulosin or Tadalafil, and there was actually no uh, net difference in those two groups. So it's a nice way to uh, uh, give them some symptomatic relief and literally eliminate the alpha blocker for however long you want. And uh, it, it certainly can't hurt. Um, David, I've been really impressed with the utility of Omedria in keeping the pupil from coming down. Now, if you're starting with a small pupil, in a, you know, an IFAS case, it's really not going to do that much. But if you're starting like the case I showed where the pupils greater than six and a half, seven millimeter pupil, those are the ones that come down and the omedria helps prevent the pupil from coming down and, and tends to stiffen the iris. And I think it's because of the fact that it's got the phenylephrine in it. And, you know, our colleagues in, in uh, Europe have the commercially available phenylephrine one and a half percent that they use. And they have all said that that has helped to decrease the amount of times they've had to use either iris hooks or a ring device when you're using the phenylephrine. So I think that in the U.S. we can get a hold of the omedria, and the omedria with the phenylephrine in it will prevent that pupil from coming down, prevent the iris from going to the stab incision, and, and prevent it from getting floppy. So I find that helpful in these cases where the pupil is initially, you know, moderately dilated. But I think if you don't have access to omidria, you could also do sugar cane or essentially preservative-free 1% lidocaine, which is really cheap. Um, so I think that's an alternative because not every patient can get omidria and not everyone has access to it. But so I think omidria is excellent as well, just as an alternative. Those are um, there's always the debate of hooks versus a ring in these patients. And I, I'm in the hooks camp because the hooks tether the iris to the limbus, whereas a ring expands the pupil, but it's still floating around in there. And so you can still get some IFAS in the worst cases with the ring uh, as compared to hooks. So that's just my preference. Yeah, just for our international audience, Omidria is a brand of BSS that's containing phenylephrine and Ketorlac, uh, but I'm not, it's not widely available outside the US. It's also very expensive uh, <clears throat> in the United States. So uh, I think you've all made the point that any uh, alpha agonist uh, can help to sort of saturate the receptors. With the IFAS, it's really the tone of the iris, of the iris that uh, the rigidity is from the uh, dilator muscle, um, you know, and its tone. So uh, phenylephrine is available. I think that is a first choice. Uh, epinephrine is a widely available. Uh, it's a very low pH, so you would never inject it directly. You have to dilute it, maybe four to one. And as long as you do that, uh, uh, epinephrine, also inexpensive, widely available, uh, works well. I think there was one question, are there any tips when you're about to start the case that, you know, you're going to have IFAS in a patient with tamsulosin? And if you inject, let's say, lidocaine or, or BSS, and you see any quivering of the pupil, you know already it's not uh, rigid. So for sure, um, you know, I, I would just advocate if you're, you're not going to use mechanical devices to use a alpha agonist such as phenylephrine, epinephrine, uh, omidria, if you have it available. Uh, but if it's still quivering, then that's when I would uh, err on the side of putting in retractors. And then other factors such as, is it a brunescent lens? Do you have you know, pseudoexfoliation. Do you have other risk factors? I think when in doubt, uh, Aaron, on the side of taking the extra time 
uh, to make the pupil larger. That was that became that was so beautifully illustrated by Nick's case, where the the rest of the time the inability to have a good red reflex really made a difference. Yeah. All right. Uh, any uh, final? Let's see. I think we've gone through most of the questions. Uh, just a note to the audience that this uh, seminar will be posted on CyberSite uh, later today, probably within four hours. Uh, so you can go back and review it or uh, tell your colleagues uh, about it, where it will be uh, permanently archived on uh, CyberSite. Uh, I, I let's see, one question, do you consider iris stretching to be a contraindication in IFAS? Mitch? Yes. <laughs> Short answer. <laughs> yeah, yes. Any manipulation, the problem is any manipulation is going to trigger uh, some meiosis and you don't have a, a good dilator muscle uh, react, you know, so that's a uh, that's a nice point uh, that the uh, the doctor raised there, right? Well, uh, we're at the end of our uh, 90 minutes, so uh, I do want to especially thank our marvelous faculty. These were great teaching cases. It was a great panel discussion. Uh, I hope the audience uh, got something out of this. And again, thanks to Orbis and CyberSight for hosting this and also uh, archiving this and so many wonderful educational resources uh, for, for all of us to learn from uh, from the comfort of our desktop computers. So I wish everyone uh, a, a good uh, weekend. And uh, again, thanks to our audience for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.